your writing career, Har Tree. Okay. All right. So welcome to Har Tree. And how do I pronounce your last name, please? Uh, you know what? Chuck Polinick is the same way. He's always afraid people uh, that he's going to mispronounce my name when he mentions it. But yeah. It's Venturini, V-E-N-T-U-R-I-N-I. -I. I always say it's spelled the way that it sounds. Venturini. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, it does look like it's spelled like how it sounds. Venturini. Well, welcome yep. to Hard Tree, Mr. Venter Fred Venturini. And yeah. we are here discussing today your novel, to horror novel, To Dust You Shall Return. So we are very right. happy to have you on, and I'm Ivana Sanders, also known as the Novelette. <laughs> That's my stage name. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Everybody needs a stage name, so. Thank you, thank you. All righty, so we're going to get started on the interview. I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Yeah. So when did you begin writing fiction? As long as I can remember, uh, you know, my nine-year-old is around. She writes stories every now and again. And I think that's about when I started. Uh, think about, you know, I had a Nintendo and one of the old ones where the games did not have like stories and stuff. And I think it was Dragon Warrior, like a 1989 uh, game. I wasn't satisfied with how the game ended. So I remember writing out the story uh, of the game because there were so many gaps in it. I mean, now games take 400 hours and there's no stone left unturned. <laughs> exactly. But that's like the first thing that I remember writing. So and I've been kind of at it ever since. So let's see, roughly 32-ish years of uh, <laughs> writing fiction. <laughs> Enough to become, to, uh, uh, become a, uh, uh, hone in your craft. Yeah, that's, that's a thing for sure always refining it. I know exactly what you mean. I started, I, I'm a writer too. I'm an author and I'm also an anthology editor. And so I, uh, I, I uh, publish anthologies. I did one um, that was a killer thriller anthology. And then I just recently did one called Aesthetic, a dark academia anthology. And that's mm. 25 authors all about young adult, and new adult um, stories set in academic settings. Mine, as always, I wrote dark fiction because that's what I do. <laughs> and I've been, I've been writing. Good. Thank you. I've been writing ever since I was very little. When I used to play with my little toys uh, with my older sister, there was like, so, there was like drama storylines, like weekly events that happened in these stories. And I feel like that was my creative nature coming out. Even then, yeah, I, well, I yeah, love it. especially back then, uh, I needed a creative outlet. Uh, there wasn't as many entertainment options in the 80s and 90s as there are quite now. So, yes, I understand. So, did you have to do any research to write this book? You know, I always think of a story that I heard about the show Under the Dome which was, I think it was on CBS. Mm -hmm. And they were all sitting around in like a, a writer's room or executive room or something. And they had these books of information and research about what it would be like under the dome, what the atmosphere would be like under the dome, what the temperature would do, what the air would do. And, and Stephen King was in there and he just said, you know, you can just make this shit up. <laughs> and I'm from that school. I try to do minimal research at first. I want to take an imaginative crack at it then you go in and you fill the gaps. I think if you're researching for fiction, it, especially with a first draft, uh, it's just going to slow you down. So, you know, when you add those little touches of research, when, you're, when you write a scene and then you kind of dig into it that way, sure, there's some research there. But for the most part, I like to just go. I like to make stuff up. And, you know, you can bend the rules of the world if you want to. So I, that's my answer for that. That's very true. It's like you let your um, creative nature, your creativity just flow and it just comes just like that almost. And then maybe we have to tweak it a little bit in the end <laughs> to make it factual to uh, real life. That's what it's set into. But mostly it's like just creative license. Yeah. And I'm shocked at how many times I kind of get something right. Yeah. Like yeah. you wonder, you try and make up a product that doesn't exist and then you find out it exists. 
or you make up a disease that doesn't exist and then you find out it exists. Yeah. So, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> That's true. So your book reminds me of almost of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Well, that's um, high praise. All right. <laughs> but the thing is, I think that, but, but I think that your book adds more complex three-dimensional characters, which I love so much. Because every time I see a movie in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series, I always think that I always feel like something's missing. Like there's there's a lack of depth almost. But your book completed what the franchise, where the franchise has weak places at to me. It like filled in those spaces. And um, there's a really compelling theme of survival, like by any means necessary, any means necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any other themes that you would hope that readers pick up on while reading To Dust You Shall Return? Well, just to circle back for a second about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, the, the first entry in almost any horror franchise is you fear for the victims and you're kind of afraid of the monster, but eventually you start to root for the monster and that becomes the series. Yeah. So all, all the characters just become disposable. You know, the formula, Oh, she's annoying, but she's going to get killed. You know, who's going to be the final girl, all of that stuff. So uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's an interesting element. I want to keep the monsters as the monsters. Oh. And the only way you can get invested in a horror story is, is if you give a crap about what happens to somebody. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what stakes is. So themes, you know, something, I don't think many authors really like do their themes on purpose. I think if you try to go into a piece of work uh, and say, I'm going to give it an undercurrent of social commentary, or I'm going to try and make the, the, the theme of the novel this, I, I don't think it works. I think the scenes and the gears kind of show. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of amazing when other people tell me what they pick up on, you know, in my work as a whole, uh, you know, as an example, the treatment of small towns. You know, I came from a real small town and it's not like I ever, you know, Jones to get out of there. It wasn't like, Oh my God, I got to leave this place. But it was just, I couldn't come up with a bunch of compelling reasons to just stay generation after generation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I also think it's really weird that in Hollywood, there's this trope of small towns are good and big cities are bad. You know, Sweet Home Alabama comes to mind. That, that's the trope. Oh, these quirky people in this small town. But in a horror story, if you run into a small town. <laughs> Something bad is happening. You're in, yeah, you're in, you're in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, small towns show up in, you know, all of my work. Uh, in this one, it really is front and center. Uh, specifically because when I was younger, someone who, you know, lived in, what was I, 15 years old, I remember saying, you know, I'm going to go away to college. And someone's like, why would you ever want to leave here? And I'm like, whoa. And that really always stuck with me. I was yeah. like, and that's obviously made its way into the book a little bit. Uh, and the other one is, I think in this book, it's like a religious overtone, I guess. Once again, I didn't try to put it in there, but someone had mentioned, a fellow author had mentioned, wow, oh, you know, there's like communion in the book. Like it's a really dark mirror image uh, of organized religion in a small town. You know, like you're in a small town, everybody goes to church on Sunday. Everybody takes their communion on Sunday. You know, if you're not there, why isn't so-and-so there? <laughs> yeah. And I think that this town has a, you know, a dark mirror image of that. You know, there's no churches in the town because the church is uh, the occult presence that's right. there already. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. That is all very interesting. And I could see some of those things standing out in the story. I'm just thinking back to the things I read in the story. I'm like, that does stay with it. Yeah. That's really cool. So which character in To Dust You Shall Return was the hardest to write and why? I guess it was Beth because it started off as a completely uh, different character. And, you know, I rewrote that book nine times. Uh, I think the first time I ever put a page down on it was 2014 wow. and it, you know, it used to be an annoying teenage boy was in the middle of the story. And once I made the switch into Beth as the heart of the story, like the referee of the story, the idealistic person in the story and put her in a position where 
she could discover things along with the audience. That's when I feel like it really started to uh, take off. You know, having some sort of badass scarred up action hero, uh, that was easy. You know, I'm a VHS 80s kid, and that includes all of the action movies like Commando and uh, Into the 90s, all the Schwarzenegger and Stallone and uh, Revenge movies, which are some of my favorites. So that was the toughest one to get right because it was kind of the heart of the story and you couldn't really crack the rest of it open unless you had her in there and you had her right. Like there couldn't be any forced romance in there. Uh, I like that, you know, Trent, her friend slash boyfriend in the story is there's not any deeper forced romance in there. Uh, As a matter of fact, the the fact that they resist it because of the circumstances of the town uh, you know, I thought it added a, a surprising element to it. And when I say surprising, it surprises me too. <laughs> I, th- I think all authors will say, wow, I'm kind of surprised how that character kind of reacted in that situation. And, and once you, once you have that going, yeah, then you're in a good spot. Yeah. Cause the characters write themselves. They really do. It's like, we're just kind of the best book for them almost. Yeah. Once you get them going, you know, they tend to take over. So yeah. that's where you want to get. <laughs> that's true. So what inspired the character of Curtis Quinn? And is he symbolic to any deeper meaning without giving away any spoilers? Yeah, so one of my favorite character archetypes is the reactivated badass character. You see it a lot in revenge movies. Uh, Typically, this person used to be a (laughs) badass, but he's not that way anymore. And then some circumstance makes it to where it has to awaken And a lot of times that badass part of themselves is rusty. So I think the number one example of this is a 1992 Western, uh, Unforgiven, where William Money is a former criminal gunslinger. And throughout the movie, you know, everybody says, oh, it's that William Money. He's a killer of women and children. He did some dark things. Mm -hmm. He's, He's a badass. And with about 10 minutes left in the movie, he comes back. Wow. Right, and it makes for this this badass finish. In sci-fi, it's old Luke Skywalker from the Last Jedi, which you know a lot of people disagree with the way that it was done, but that's such a powerful story trope. Is we got to get old man Luke to dust off the lightsaber and come back and help us, and when he does, you get that moment. Yeah. So, I think he's mostly inspired by, you know, the, the early '90s kind of action heroes and revenge characters. The thing that I have a problem with now with like the John Wick type movies is the reactivation happens too early, I right? See. You know, so John Wick is like, it's great to have the Russians scared of him. You know, he's the Baba Yaga, he's the boogeyman and all this yeah. stuff. But 25 minutes into the movie, he's digging up his guns and he has no issues whatsoever killing everybody. Yeah. It's like watching a video game. So what I loved about Unforgiven, what I tried to do here is there is a lot of stakes in play to reactivate when William money and unforgiven picks up the bottle again and is going to go back and be violent again. It's one of the weird times in a story where the hero loses by refusing to actually change. He was terrible. He had changed. And then the circumstances of the movie make him revert back into the evil he used to be. Uh, So I think that was just another cool part of it. And that's, I think why some people call it an anti-Western. Yeah. I've heard it called that sometimes. But yes, delaying that reactivation to where if this switch is flipped, I lose a part of myself uh, and the stakes are, are, are pretty high. So that's a little bit about the inspiration of the character. I like that so much. Uh, the, the whole, it, it adds more depth of character, having almost like that slow burn um, um, turn back into who they used to be. And that is one of my pe- my pet peeves about the John Wick franchise because I felt like first I thought I felt like the uh, the the fact that they killed his dog and everything in Soul's car I thought that because it was random it had less depth it was random they didn't know who he was he should have been targeted like that would have been more impactful to me and then it would have been great if they had a delayed his transformation back into who he was again like it just it felt anticlimactic somehow. And I, this, I just recently saw the John Wick series the first time ever. And um, I watched them all in a, a marathon in a row. And I just felt like once it got to the third um, movie in the franchise, I was like, it could have just 
little bit more, you know, to the story. It's almost nothing. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> struggle. He didn't struggle. He, no. he, he, still he digs up the guns. Right. He digs up the guns. He's still as good as he used to be. Yeah. And literally just goes through the game, goes through the movie like a video game. Yeah. Uh, but the appeal of it is it's a dance movie. You 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 have this they let you see the action instead of all that crazy choppy cam stuff that you might see in like a green grass movie like you get a big wide angle of what they're doing. Yeah. And it's almost like watching a dance. It's like watching choreography. Yeah. So I think that's part of the appeal of it. Uh but with the sequels, sequels are giving the people more of what they think you want. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately for most people it's like can he kill some people with books? <laughs> can he kill some people with horses? Apparently so. How many ways can he kill people? Yeah, so I think that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. He could have had more depth if there was at least a little bit of a delay, some sort of, or some sort of inner toiling that he goes through. Yeah. So that's pretty cool that you put it in your character because that's a great, that's a great added quality to the storytelling. I'm sure the readers will appreciate that. I know I do. Yeah. So what advice would you give about pitching a horror story? Pitching a horror story. Mm-hmm. Like um, a lot of authors now, like the budding authors out there, they're like doing, you know, they're, they're, they want advice on like their query letters. How do you get a horror story to stand out? What tropes would you suggest highlighting or not? But what kind of advice would you be, maybe be able to give them? Well, first, believe in it and want to write it. Like I think that that's one thing. Sometimes you're like, giving people what you think that they want, you know? Uh, And I know there's a thing in horror now, it's like use the rules and use the tropes as part of the story's setup. Don't do any of that. Just do (laughs) play to your strengths. And if you can do something new and fresh uh, with the tropes of the genre, absolutely, you know, pitch that in, in that kind of way. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because I think you pitch the highest possible concept that you can if you're pitching. Like, can you describe it in one line? Yeah. And if you can't, it's not, you're not there yet with the idea, you know? Uh, and it's almost like that little Hollywood thing. It's this meets this. <laughs> and the first one is to let you know, and they're both there to let you know that it can make money. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I had a friend of mine describe... Uh, the, you know, the new book as John Wick meets the Wicker Man, which is, you know, it's a pretty cool, I was like, oh, I like that. Can I, can I co-op that and start using it? Uh-huh. Uh, but that's this, a real simple way to, to distill the story. So I guess if you're pitching and I haven't had a chance to pitch too much, I just write what I want to write here. Do you like it? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, be able to summarize in one line. Make sure it's something you're excited to write and do something new if you can. Cool. Very cool. Thank you for that. And um, our next question will be, what does the act of writing itself mean to you? Hmm. I've never been specifically asked that question before. What does it mean to me? I guess it means you're doing something with your free time that like, has some sort of tangible result. (laughs) Like I play video games and I always feel guilty about it. Like, Oh my God, I'm just burning up. I mean, I enjoy it, but you know, you can have an addictive personality and you can play games all you want. uh, Or you can, you know, binge out at Netflix or, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do where you're not done with it and you go, wow, this is like something that could be in the library of Congress. This is something my grandkids could read. Uh, so there's, there's part of that. It's, it's rewarding, I guess, is the word. Uh, and it's fun. You know, I, there's, I go long stretches without writing anything sometimes. Uh, just because it's the, the idea and the act, you know, has to be fun. Yeah. And I guess I should caveat that with, don't let that be an excuse to not be disciplined. Like, I don't believe in writer's block, I, but I do believe in having fun with what you're doing. So, and I, and I think part of the thing that sucks the fun out of it is, do you like writing or do you like the idea of being published and mm-hmm. being a famous writer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I see a lot of that, you know. 
Yeah, there's got to be passion in it. And it's like, it's got to be something that is rewarding at the end of the day. Even if, even if it doesn't get published, it's like, but did you enjoy it? Are you enjoying the process? It's like, that's Yeah, crazy. and mm -hmm. you got to write a lot of crap to write something good. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I'm at a high school and a 16-year-old comes up to me and goes, I just wrote a novel, will you, you know, will you read it? I'm like, I know it's not going to be good. <laughs> is it your first draft? Yeah. Is it oh, as no. good as you can make it? Yeah. I mean... No, no. Uh, this, okay, throw that one away and start on the next one. Yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, I think that's part of it. Yeah, and sometimes when you write, it's like we have to let it, even if we finish it, it has to stick, you know, and then we have to, you know, come back to it and see what's different, what's changed. Get beta readers, editors if you can. It's like mm -hmm. there's got to be more to sculpt it into what, it, you know, it's final version because this final version will always be better even if some things have to be trimmed off because sometimes less is more especially with <laughs> amateur writing <laughs> and so uh, it's, yeah. it's something that has to be learned over time and we're all still learning yeah well there's a draft of this book it was 160,000 words really? uh, that, that's a lot of words to remove I think it's settled in around 110 mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. I forget but it was it was a monster and there was a lot to get rid of. You know, you have to really choose what's going to be the most effective uh, thing. And, you know, it's a book I rewrote every year while I was doing other stuff. You know, I published novels in between this one. I really took my time with it and wanted to make sure that it was right. And part of that is, you know, I, my first book, The Heart Does Not Grow Back comes out. So I leave this book alone for a while. And I didn't know if I'd pick it back up. But when I started reading it, it's like another person wrote it. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this is a banger. Who wrote this? It's like, I got to redo this thing. So I, I think that there is, you know, there's something to it. Uh, don't finish something and then like publish it on Amazon within 30 seconds for sure. Uh, take your time. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. So personally, what is the best TV or movie adaptation of a book to you? It's Fight Club. I mean, far ah. enough, that's the first one that comes to mind. Uh, it's the one that's closest to the novel. And I think it actually takes what the novel did to a, to another level. And the book is a classic. It's awesome. And I think Chuck Palahniuk even says that the book, he really does sign off on how good the movie was. Uh -huh. And I think that's part of it. So that's always the first one that comes to mind for me. It was a, it's a, it's a short, intense book. And I think short books make better movies. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's what all the book, the, the book is always better. Well, cause the book is much longer. <laughs> it, it, you can't fit a book into 90 minutes. You know, a short story makes a better uh, movie than a book does. A book makes a great TV series a lot of oh, times because yeah. there's a lot of material there. So oh, yeah. I like short, I, I like short series and um, my favorite, my favorite movie adaptation of the book is the Shawshank Redemption. And that was a short story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, let's see, he had, it was different seasons, there were four novellas in there, uh -huh. and, you know, a novella is just a long story, and mm -hmm. there was some, it was Shawshank Redemption, which was a great movie, I think Stand By Me was in there, uh, as the body, the body was in there, uh, forget the other two, one of them I know was made into a movie, I should know this, but just having those two in there is enough, so. Yeah, I did not know Stand By Me with um, Stephen King. Yeah, no, it, people still get surprised when I say, you know, Shawshank Redemption was written by Stephen King. No. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. And the thing is, not, it's not overly, like, it's not overtly scary. There's, some, there's some, some, some darker moments, I guess. It's not super scary, like it, kind of. So I think people are like, that's Stephen King. He's just so toned down. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a guy that just 2,000 words a day and... He's having fun, and if the story interests him, he doesn't care if it's scary or not. He's just going to write what he wants to write. So, Yeah, that's great. Okay, we've made it to the second to last question. Um, do you have stories on the back burner, which I'm assuming you do. <laughs> do you have stories on the back burner that are just waiting to be written? And if so, would, can you share what we can anticipate from you in the future? I've got a lot of high concept stuff that I want to write as a book or a story. Uh, I just wrote 
I just finished a short story. I'm trying to take all my high concept books and kind of get them out of my system. So, the, you know, one is like they have these ayahuasca retreats where you go and take psychedelics oh, yeah. on an island or something. Oh, right. So, yeah. So I did a, a horror story that revolves around that. You know, you take the psychedelics and instead of seeing things, you know, you become things. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I've got a story I'm trying to write where there's a street drug called white light that can transport you to the afterlife. I've always I'm fascinated by religion. So I always want to explore something like that. And uh, I've got kind of a slasher novel going like imagine that there was a prestige HBO series called Haddonfield, right? It's about the town uh -huh. where every few years a supernatural, obviously supernatural and vulnerable slasher shows up and starts murdering people. And people still live there, you know? And, uh, you know, I watch the sequels to all these movies and it's like, well, that Jason Voorhees story, that, that didn't happen. That was a long time ago. No, it was, it was two years ago. Yeah. You should be able to look it up. What are you, what are you doing at, at Crystal Lake? Yeah. Why are you living in Haddonfield when you know that every couple of Halloweens, this guy shows up, kills a bunch of people. They shoot him. You think he's dead and he keeps coming back. Why are you still living there? Yeah. So. You think it'd be deserted. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that that's a, a story that resonated with me right now because a lot of horror stories are about being against the monster or fighting the monster. And when COVID was really about living with the monster. Ah. And I think that's what that's about where, uh, you know, a slasher showing up and killing somebody is just like the weather, you know? Yeah. Oh, he showed up the other day, killed six people last week, but you know, <laughs> and, uh, worst one yet, you know, just <laughs> acting like it's bad weather. Yeah. So, that that's the concept that I'm exploring is a, a town that has been decimated by a slasher that is totally prepared for his return. But there's the type of people there that are just waiting for him to show up to cover their own bad deeds. So <gasps> oh, they're gonna that's, use that's him part like of what I'm working on. Frame him <laughs> for yeah. your stuff. Oh, yeah. Like well, imagine if you were a depraved serial killer. I would like to live in that town, and you wait till he shows up, and you can go on your own spree, and then he'll get blamed for it. You know, stuff like that. So totally. <laughs> yeah. That is great. I like that. I don't think I've ever yeah. seen that in a movie before, and I would love to see yeah. that in a book. <laughs> well, that's really what it's about. I try to write things that I I would enjoy. Uh, I'm not trying to entertain yeah. ten million people. I'm trying to entertain like the five people that might like what I write, you know, it's yeah. like such a narrow lane. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things about to dust you shall return. A lot of people, Oh, I like a revenge character, but it's too violent or, Hey, I like a good coming of age story. Uh, but it's too dark, you know? So uh, you know, I write for a very small amount of people. And I think that that's how you do it. Uh, I know a lot of people that write with their ideal reader in mind, just one person. Yeah. So, cool. so yeah. Oh, wonderful. And so we can learn more about you, your published books, To Dust You Shall Return, and your future books. Where can we find you on social media and see more about your future releases? Yeah, well, kind of crappy at social media, but I'm kind of out there. Uh, at Fred Venturini on Twitter, I never tweet, but I'm on there once a day just to skim through things. Typically, if you say something about me on Twitter, I will respond to it. Uh, if you Google my name, it's a unique name. Uh, my website will be at the top. You can usually find everything I'm up to there. Uh, mostly pop my name in Amazon, you know, a few books and, and stuff is going to populate there. I've actually got a free, I'm not going to call it a novella. It's a really long short story that was pretty popular when I had it in an anthology. That's actually free on Amazon. If you want to go get a taste of what my writing is all about. So it's, yeah, it's my horror love story called a pound of flesh. A pound of flesh. So yeah, okay. we all got it. Free on Amazon. Yeah. Go pop that and enjoy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining Horror Tree for this interview. We are so happy to have you on.